Anyway, now is the time we get to give with cheerful hearts. So if the ushers would kindly prepare. In Psalm 63, 8, it says that I will cling to the Lord. Cling to the Lord and your right hand will uphold me. Okay, That's a, that's a scripture that is, is relevant to each and every one of us. Because whether we're experiencing you know, health issues or relational problems, financial problems, we know that if we cling to God, he will always uphold us with our right with his right hand the funniest thing that ever happened to me i ever witnessed in my life was about 25 years ago me and my dad we used to go fishing night fishing a lot for mempachi or holy holy so we needed bait so i don't know how i did this but i convinced my dad to go scoop bait that ice pond you know get the california grass by what was then harrington's restaurant so we're in nighttime with the scoop net and I borrowed my friend's really, really short, like nine, ten foot aluminum boat. So we can paddle out there, you know, scoop maybe hundred or so shirasa or opai and we had enough. I figured, okay, I, I like hit one more place, shallow area about four feet deep. So um, we went over there, but the thing about one small boat is if you get two grown men on one small boat like that, you got you to gotta maneuver them correctly. Like if I'm leaning one side, then my father got to lean back to counterbalance the boat, right? So anyway, we see, we see scooping and come to this one patch. And I don't know what happened, but we were both leaning back this way at the same time. So we went forward this way, and then we went back this way, and my father heels overhead, boosh into the water, man. That was hilarious. He, I never seen, hey, he did one triple somersault in the air, land back in the water, and was right in front, all the people at Harrington's restaurant. <laughs> but uh, the amazing thing is this, the old man never let her go to bucket with the bait inside. <laughs> Not even one shrimp can get away. He even cling to that bait for life, man. So anyway, <clears throat> you know, life is hard. Things will happen to us in life. But we got to remember that no matter what, we got to hold on to God. And as we do so, he will simultaneously always uphold us with his right hand. Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much, Lord, that you are a God who loves us so dearly, Lord God. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to, to demonstrate this love, this, this incredible love that cannot be um, properly comprehended because it's so great lord we thank you so much in jesus name that we get to give this morning to further your kingdom lord god we pray you would open up our hearts to receive uh, your wonderful word this morning lord god we thank you we praise you in jesus name amen so um right now pastor sheldon is going to be talking about the mind of a servant and we're going to watch a video right now about you know some some clips of some races some track races and usually in a running race the objective is to win but you'll see in this video that helping others uh, became the most important thing so enjoy this video this hill taking a toll on a couple runners trying to finish those final 20 yards wow yeah you can see <laughs> What, what a tremendous show of sportsmanship as you've got an athlete who can't quite make it and they've got a team, a, a girl from another team trying to help her to the finish line so she can finish the race. That's what, now that's what the sport is all well. about. Oh my goodness. As you see Clemson and Louisville helping the Boston College runner, that's Tate and Pease. And the Boston College runner can't even lift her legs right now. She'll try to cross the finish line. What a shot right here at Wakeman Soccer Park in Cary. But you sacrifice your own position wow. to help another athlete finish what they started. And that, that's a true sportsmanship. There, your picture also. And so we have uh, the athletes uh, coming one after the other in finishing. But a great race has uh, run there uh, by this, the man that has uh, won for this. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, cannot, legs, he cannot go again. He cannot finished. go again. He can roll to the finish. Legs are giving up. Now he can barely 
cross the finish line. He I think the medics. I think the medics should just go and there. He should rush quickly to his aid. That's the spirit. Crossing the finish line, they can crawl. You can do whatever, but just cross the finish line. At what spirit? Sportsmanship to the highest order. And now, oh, this, this is, is lovely. Wonderful. This is this is what sports should be all about. This is what sports should be all about. Yeah, Trying to be your Keep Kemoy. Oh, that's the civil Chepard, I think. Keep Kemoy. Keep that's Chepard carrying him. Now the medics should just uh, go, of course, uh, and uh, help her. They should please. They should please rush, rush, rush there. Speak, uh, they should just rush there. It's Chepard. Chep Chandler could see the finish line right when she collapsed for the first time. That's when a complete stranger came to help her up. All Chandler could think about was getting disqualified by the gesture of humanity. Ariana, the 17-year-old high school student. Um, was really trying to help me out and I even tried to push her away but her heart was just overcome with kindness and compassion for me that I think she just was like I gotta help her then it happened again and again before finally crossing the finish line after 26.2 miles she was not disqualified and came in first what an amazing feat that people would run and now we can applaud that uh, 26.2 miles marathon. They train to, to win a race. And when you experience that much fatigue and someone comes alongside of you to help you, what an encouraging act of selflessness. But at the same time, for those who have been training all those months to win that race, they gave up what they tra trained for for just that moment. I mean, how do you develop a mindset that you've been visioning this your whole entire year, or for some of us, our whole entire life, but then you give up that moment for someone else? That's, that's, a, that's a thinking on a different level than we normally would think of in the world that we live in. Usually, we think of self more than we think of others. And in this series that we're in, we're talking about what's so important about serving God. Because if we don't understand what's important about serving God, then we will ne never develop a servant mindset. Or the kind of thought that Jesus had as a servant, although he came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom to many, he's saying this is the kind of attitude I want you to have. So this morning we're going to be talking about that. How, do we de how can we develop the servant mind because we're all going to struggle with self. We live in a world that is built and, 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 and caters to self. And if we want to be more like Christ, we're going to have to learn to develop a mind that thinks like a servant. Now, I know many of us, we already have that. But I think today, it's not just about, you know, what can we do? It's, for some of us, it's just a fine tune-up. It's maintenance. It's a reminder of this is who God made us to be. And if you're a believer, especially as a believer, that this is who Jesus is as a servant. And he says, now I want you to be just like me. So we can take out our notes. Or if you're using our church app, you can take that out. And, and for those of you who are joining us online, how are you doing, Kailani? Good to know that you're on. But there are things that we do as a servant that sets us apart from anyone else in the world as a believer. And what is interesting about being a servant is it's a role that is not flashy and it's a role that not too many people will gravitate towards. We like the spotlight. We like being first. We like winning. We want that. But what Jesus came to do is show us that there is a way in the kingdom of God to serve others and to serve in such a way that God is glorified in everything that we do. You know, one of the commentators said that the only way you can do what they did and help someone else is to sacrifice your own position to help another athlete finish. Like to sacrifice your own wants, your own desires, even your own goal is what is necessary to think of other people. It's like deep down inside in, in the core of their being, they have just something that says, I, I want to serve someone else, but I'm so competitive that I don't know how to to, to make that decision. And there are many runners that will run past those who needed help. But then there are those who would stop. You know, not only did God create us to be in a loving relationship with him, he also created us to be in a, in a loving relationship with one another. 
And because of that relationship with one another, he called us to not just be saved or to, to have eternal life, but he also called us to serve. And what does that look like? How do we develop that servant mind and, and to be that person? Because it takes a long time to develop a mind like a servant if that's not something we've been doing. And the reason is because we have grown up thinking about self. And once we come into a relationship with Jesus, now we have to learn about others more than self. And we have to shift our thinking to be more like a servant rather than self-serving. And almost every day, from moment to moment, we're going to battle with serving others and dealing with self. Uh, I just recently came back from uh, Sri Lanka, which is on the other side of the, of the world. It's uh, uh, southeast of India. And I went there for a convention. They had their, you know how we have our Foursquare convention every year, a uh, national convention here in the United States. They had their national convention uh, for Foursquare in Sri Lanka which is a third world country. And so myself and Ted Vale, who is the director of Foursquare Missions International, uh, were asked to speak at the convention. So I went there on Sunday, came back last night. And by the way, the, when we talk about convention, uh, here in the United States, it's when the pastors and, and some of the church leaders go to uh, the convention to be trained, catch vision, hear the heart and vision of what God is doing throughout our denomination and around the world. It's not about a denomination. But it's about what God is doing through everyone. And in fact, we're going to be bringing the videos from that convention here on Wednesday night starting September 4th. And powerful messages uh, from different uh, speaking pastors and leaders. So I would invite you to Wednesday night, September 4th. And it's going to go on for, I think, five or six weeks that we're going to bring convention home to all of us. So that we're all on the same page. Uh, but while I was there at their convention, you know, traveling to... Uh, a foreign country, or especially on the other side of the world, them being 15 and a half hours ahead of us, uh, there are certain things that you do differently uh, than you do here. And coming back home, that was the challenge because I had to go from Sri Lanka to Bangkok to Taipei to Korea, then to, uh, of course, Honolulu and then here. But on the, the flight from Bangkok to Taipei, I only had a 55-minute uh, overlay. So my flight was leaving in 55 minutes. So my flight was leaving at 7.10. And I needed to get to the next gate. First of all, I thought I was going to stay in the same airplane. And then they just continue on. But everyone has to uh, get off of the plane. And then uh, my gate, thank God, was right next door. So I got off of the plane, and I'm like, okay, there's my gate. It's right there. And there are glass windows, so you can see right there. You see everyone waiting, and they're actually boarding already. So I'm looking at, okay, where's the door? How do I get in? So I'm trying to find someone, and I said, how do I get in there? And he said, up. You go up. I said, okay, but um, no, like that's, that's the gate. It's right here, and it's boarding, and I, I, how do I get in there? You, you up. So they just kept telling me, go up. I'm like, where do I, like, where do I go? There's, no, there's nothing that shows that there's stairs or an elevator. So they said, just walk. So I'm like, okay. So I'm walking, and I kept walking, and I'm thinking, wait, I just got to get there. So there are doors, but they were locked. And I'm like, how do I, like, how do I, like, just, can I open this door? And there are people in there. I'm like, open the, like, help me. And they're just looking at me like, well, stranger danger. Don't even... This man looks foreign, so we're not letting him in. We're protected by the glass. So I kept walking, and, and finally I got upstairs, and there are hundreds of people waiting in a line. I'm like, okay, that's not my line because I just have to get downstairs. It's, I can still see it. It's downstairs through the glass windows. I, I, that's all I got to get to. And so uh, I see some people there, and I said, hey, can I, how, do I, how do I get there? I just want to get there. They said, oh, you got to go through this line. I said, no, 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 no. My, my plane is leaving. I'm, I'm, I can't go through this line. My plane is leaving. He said, no, you, you go through this line. And I'm like, Lord, how do I do this legally? How do I? How do I? Because I'm still mindful. I'm a Christian. You know, I, how do I do this? But my, 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 my old self was like, no, all I have to do is do some of these things. So let me just say, I, 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 I got in front of the line, forgive me. So I got there, 
And I'm thinking, how do I, how do I get in that side? Because now there's security. So by the time I got through that line, there was another line of hundreds of people. And I'm thinking, how do I, I just got to get there. Now, by this time, it's probably uh, a little after 7 o'clock. My flight is leaving. And so I, this other line, I'm like, I, there's no way I'm going to make it. There's this other woman that was standing there, and she's trying to get through. I said, are you on this same flight? She goes, yes. I said, okay, I got to get on that plane. She goes, me too. So she could speak their language because I asked the lady, I said, look, I, I need to leave. My plane is leaving. She goes, no, you, same, same. I said, no, no, I, I know, I, I, yeah, I, I know, but how do I, get, how do I get here? You, same. Like with everyone else, she's saying that everyone else has to go too. I'm like, yeah, but no one is on my flight. This, I, my plane is leaving, so I need to go. I said, no, you need to be with everybody else. I said, okay, so, and she's just doing her job. She's just doing her job, so I understand that. So I'm trying to figure out how do I do this. Well, this woman speaks to her, and they could understand. And so she comes to her, and she looks at her ticket. She goes, come with me. She grabs her hand and just uh, kind of like drags her through everyone. And this lady passes me. She looks at me. I'm like, huh? And she goes, and the lady sees her, sees me. She goes, is he with you? She goes, yes. I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am with you, auntie. Let's go. Ni hao. Let's go. So that means hi. Or Okay, so. We're going, and so finally we get to the security, and we have to check our baggage in, and I just had a backpack and a, a small carry-on. So I put that on, put everything on. The lady goes through. She's gone. I get all my things. I go on the other side, and I'm getting my things together. And then the woman there calmly says, do you have a laptop and iPad? I said, yes. She goes, you need to take out. I said, oh, so I had to take that out, go back around and send it through security. I'm like, can't you just look at it and say, okay, it's good. No, you got to send it through. So I had to send that through. And then I'm trying to grab all my things. I'm like, come on, I got to go. By this time, it's 7.14. And my flight leaves at 7.10. So I'm like, come on. And then she says, you have a uh, bottle of water? I'm like, oh, my hydro flask, come on. So, and it's filled with water. So she goes, I need to dump it out. I said, okay, go ahead, go ahead, dump it out. I'm like, you're doing this on purpose, aren't you? <laughs> so she's, she's slowly, I'm like, my thought is, shh, shh, <laughs> go. Hers is, shh, 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 shh. Now, in, when you're in a rush, it seems super slow. So she takes it off, and she dumps it on, like, like, leave the hydro flask. But it's not mine, it's Heidi, so I had to take the hydro flask. <laughs> so she was done doing that. By the time I'm getting to my gate, it's seven, past 720. I think it was 723, 724. And so I get to my gate area, I'm like, hey, what, how, do I, how do I get in? By this time, everything's cleared out. There's no one there. Gate is closed, but the plane is still there. I'm like, I can jump through this window and hang on to this plane. And how do I get there? Now, there's a, there's a little gate. So I can hop over. I mean, it's just that simple. I can jump over and walk down the steps. But then I'm thinking, no, I'll be on the front news. So how do I do this? There's this woman walking, and she's the person in charge of the carts. And had a, had a trolley on top of her shirt. So I said, excuse me, how do I get down there? She goes, nope. I said, no, 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 no. I wasn't asking if I can. I was like, how? How, how, do, I, how do I get there? I can just, can I, <laughs> I'm asking this worker, can I just hop over this and just right, it's right there. She goes, no. This man sees me trying to do that. He comes up to me. He goes, uh, sir, are you okay? I'm like, you speak English. He goes, yes, what, are you okay? He's, he's looking at me like, well, what's wrong with you? What? I said, I, I just need to get there. He said, that's your, your flight. I said, yes, and it's leaving, so I, can I get there? So I just got to get, can you open this gate? So he goes on the radio, and he says something to them, and then he's, he nods, and he just flips a latch. I'm like, I could have done that. So he flips the latch, opens it up, and he looks at me. He goes, run. I'm like, that I understand. <laughs> That I understand. Ran down, and the women were down there. They're like, hurry. I'm like, I'm trying. Okay, I've been trying all this time. 
So finally I get there, sweating, and carrying all my bags, and I'm like shaking and trying to give them my passport and everything. The lady by the door is like, you hurry. I'm like, you got to hurry. Like, take my stuff, figure it out, and then meet me on the plane. That's my thought. Just get me on the plane. So finally I get there, and they're like, yay, I'm like, yay. <laughs> Felt like the marathon runners crossing the line, just crawling. Like, Come on. <laughs> I got on the plane sweating, and even people on the plane looking at me like, oh, so you are the hang up. <laughs> so, so I sit there, and I'm just like throbbing headache, and I'm sitting there, and all that time I felt the Lord saying, Do you trust me? I mean, this isn't no Aladdin, do you trust me? It was, Do you trust me? All along the way, and I'm like, Lord, I trust you, but I don't see it. This lady's taking long. This person is doing this. This person is doing that. I don't, I don't see it. And he says, that's what trust is. You don't see it. It's difficult. It's dark. It's not going your way. Timing is off. Everything is off. But do you trust me? And this is what I learned, even in that short moment, that I cannot think of others when I'm in a rush thinking of myself. I didn't think of all the others that I just bypassed. I didn't think about people that were stranded there. I didn't think about people and how can I serve them. I'm thinking about how do I get on this plane. The thing about having a servant mind is we, we will not be able to do this on our own. Jesus was the greatest servant of all. And he gives us his word so that we can learn how to develop a servant mind. There's a woman by the name of Ruth and she had a servant mindset. She was able to not just serve well, but give up everything, her values, the gods that she served, to be committed to her mother-in-law, whose name was Naomi. And because of her giving up of self, she was able to not just become greater in the eyes of God, but she was able to prosper as she continued to serve God and serve others. And she continued to serve Naomi, her mother-in-law. Now, the Bible tells us this in, second, uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. It's like saying, just, just hold on for a little bit. If you're only thinking about yourself, you're not going to be able to think about anyone else. You just have to hold off long enough to help someone else, to lend that helping hand. Now, there's a phrase that we use. I'm, I'm not sure if it's just here in Hawaii, but there's a phrase that we use that when someone is on your team and they don't want to share the ball, we call them something. What is it? Yeah, ball hogger, hog cheese. I'm like, where does this come from? Who named it? But really, no one wants that person on their team. And what God does is he says, I'm going to send you the perfect example through my son, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to give you other examples as as through the word of God, I'm going to show you other people that they were able to accomplish having that servant mindset when they relied on me, that it came from who I am. It says that Ruth, in uh, Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, Ruth replies to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. You see, Ruth married Naomi's son. Naomi had two sons. Naomi's husband dies, leaves Naomi a widow. Then her two sons die, and now Ruth and uh, Naomi's uh, other daughter-in-law, uh, Orpah, are both widows also. So Ruth and Orpah both being widows, and being with the mother-in-law, Naomi, Naomi says, hey, why don't you guys go back to your home country? Because even if I had children, you're not going to wait for them to grow up. So you might as well go back home. Well, Orpah goes back home, but Ruth says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you. Ruth just had something inside of her that said, I, wanna, I, I, I want to. That God that you're following, Naomi, that's the God I want. Naomi had that mindset also. That Ruth caught and she began to follow See, if we follow that example, we too can develop that mindset of a servant. And it's going to start in a couple of ways. Here's the first thing. We have to shift what we think is important. Because whatever we value or whatever we choose to do, to us it's important. It may not be important to other people, but to us it's very important and it is very valuable. 
And when Ruth decided to leave with Naomi, she was walking away from her culture, her values. Even though she may have had some good values, she, she reset herself and began a new set of values, and she had to shift in what she thought was important. When Heidi and I were first married and attending church, learning about what serving meant and what, what, what it was like to be uh, a married couple as believers, we had to learn the roles of each other and, and how, how serving one another was, was the greater way for a successful marriage. So we had to shift our way of thinking. Well, I'm living here, and my mom who is still living on Oahu in Waimanalo. She's not seeing Heidi and I make that change in our family to serve one another and make that shift. So when I'm at my mom's house and Heidi and I are doing things like washing dishes and things like that, my mom doesn't understand how we shifted from how we were before. So we were staying at my mom's house for a little while. We were visiting. And I figure I'm at my house. This is, you know, where I grew up. So I'm going to serve Heidi, you know, breakfast and then things like that. So I'm cooking breakfast. And Heidi is still sleeping. And my mom comes up to me and she goes, hey, um, how come you're cooking? And I said, what do you mean, how come I'm cooking? She goes, yeah, how come, how come Heidi's not cooking? Now, my mom is a single mom, so we grew up in that way. My mom did everything because my dad left us, so my mom did everything. And so she's wondering, like, why isn't Heidi helping? Like, that's, that's the normal. She was supposed to be cooking for you. I said, no, no, no mom, I'm fine. I'll, I'll make breakfast. She's tired. So she goes, huh, okay. You know, mother-in-law, right? Not that mother-in-laws are bad, but my mom at that time was, <clears throat> so you're good now, mom, though. <laughs> Just in case, yeah, she'd call me right now. It's saying, uh, mom, yeah, I'm watching online. <laughs> so after breakfast, we're cleaning up. I take the dishes to the sink. My mom comes to me. She goes, how come you're taking the dishes to the sink? And how come Heidi's just sitting down? Now, she's talking loud enough that Heidi can hear. So, and Heidi just, she just, you know, takes it and just, nah, it's okay, it's okay. So we're done with that. And then, I, you know, I'm going to wash clothes. So I grab the clothes and I'm walking. She goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm going I'm to wash clothes. She's like, you know, all morning you've been doing everything. Heidi didn't do anything. <laughs> By this time, Heidi hears. And I'm like, oh, man, it's going to be on scrap. Something's going to happen. <laughs> and, um, and nothing happened, but my, my mom just said, you know, um, Heidi, how come you're not helping? She goes, huh? She goes, how come you're not helping him? Like, he's, he's doing everything. And, like, Heidi didn't know how to respond. She's like, well, he, he's, he's doing it. He told me not to do anything. Now, Heidi grew up in a household that they've, they've learned how to cook and clean, and they clean very well, Portuguese. <laughs> so she knows what to do. But my mom wasn't used to watching Heidi and I do what we call teamwork. We just help each other. So by this time, my mom is watching this, and she just doesn't understand. And so she gets a little heated, and my mom says, you know, you're doing everything, and she's just lazy sitting down. I was like, Mom, you know, i got to go back with her. <laughs> so <laughs> I, wanna... now, I, wasn't, I wasn't that calm, but this is the Christian version. So my mom and I were going back and forth, and, and Heidi's just like, what do I do? And I said, you know, Heidi, and this is after we were, everybody was calm. I said, Heidi, my mom just doesn't understand that we're trying to do it God's way, that we're trying to serve one another, trying to help one another. Not everyone will understand when you make that mental shift of servanthood. Not everybody's going to understand that. Your own family may not understand it. But the best way to make that shift is to remember what Jesus did and how he, he was able to make that shift from being the God of the universe and then coming in human form. Galatians 5.13 tells us, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So the question is, where do we need to shift our thinking where, where do we shift our thinking at work or even with our children when, when everyone else is doing the normal or gossiping or whatever is being done? Can we shift our thinking into servanthood? Can I shift my thinking into, God, I want to be more like you? Can I shift my thinking into seeing things how Jesus sees things and come back to being a servant with humility rather than indulging the flesh with our children, 
when they want to just you know, jump all over you and, and want your undivided attention. Can I shift my thinking from being on my phone and being with my children? Can I focus on them more than I am on the computer or TV? Can I give my undevoted time? It's going to take a mental shift for us to get there. And it's not easy in the world we live in today. And it doesn't matter if, it, if, if we've been brought up that way or, 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 or what our culture is. It will come back to our, our, the way we think. It is very difficult to think of others when we've been used to thinking about self. And sometimes it feels like, well, maybe we shouldn't talk about this because it almost seems like we're bad people. It's not necessarily that. It's just not in our nature. It's survival mode. We think of ourself. The Bible tells us don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude as Christ Jesus had. That's Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. See, we cannot be servant-minded while thinking about ourselves. So what is that attitude that the Bible is talking about with Jesus? Well, Matthew chapter 28, verse, excuse me, chapter 20, verse 28 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's Jesus. We have to shift our thinking. Not only shift our thinking and, 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 and what we think is important, but the second thing is to choose to be a servant. It's a choice that we make. You know, after Naomi returned to Bethlehem with Ruth, Ruth realized they needed something to eat. What she didn't do is look at Naomi and say, you know, you dragged me all the way here to Bethlehem. There's nothing to eat. Like, go make something for us. No, you know what Ruth did? Ruth served. Ruth chapter 2, verse 2. Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Which is a part of the culture. God commanded that when you have fields, that when you're gleaning, you leave some of the, some others, uh, don't, don't take the whole harvest, leave some for those who are less fortunate, the poor, and they can glean, which is what Ruth was doing. But Ruth said a statement, she goes, no, no, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain. Let, let me do that. It's the conversation that we have when you're sitting at home, you're relaxed, you're in your relaxed home clothes, and then dinner is being made, and there's one ingredient that is necessary that someone has to go to the store for. And it's like, oh, there's no tomato sauce. We need tomato sauce. And you're sitting down like, oh, shucks. <laughs> oh, man. Tomato sauce. Can't eat spaghetti without it. Uh, good, good eye, honey. Way to, way, to, way to catch that. Yeah, so since I'm cooking... Can you go to the store? I just got home. Like, why didn't you call me on the way home? I didn't know by then. Well, why didn't you check before? Oh, now you're saying it's my fault we didn't nap? Yeah. <laughs> like, now I got to go. You know what? Ruth said, no, no, let, let me go. See, the servant mind is always thinking of others. Naomi, I'm fine. Let, let me go. I, I, I can do this. See, when, when Ruth is doing this, she... She, she sets herself up and starts gleaning. You know what she doesn't do? Look around at what everyone else is doing. She's, she's collecting everything. She, she has a, a, a goal, and she's thinking of others, and she's picking up. Rather than looking around and saying, wow, that person gets, has more than me. Oh, I'm going to take their side because their, their side has more. See, the servant mind is not looking at other servants and saying, how can I, how can I be better? Or why do they have? They, the servant mind never compares. Because we run into trouble when we start comparing and thinking that, wow, that person is not doing as much as me. How come, how come they, they get away with those things? Or that person at work that it comes in late and I always come on time and they get the same accolades as me. And it's like, wow, that person got promoted? Wow. <laughs> that person got promoted? I don't know. <laughs> and we're forgetting about who we're supposed to be. That we can be the people who chooses to be a servant. It's a choice that we make. It doesn't come naturally for us. The Bible even tells us in Galatians 5.26 that we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. Each of us is an original. 
There's no one else like, like you. There's no one else that is created like you. You are an original. Some of us feel good about it, like, yeah, I am an original. And others are like, good thing, only get one of you. <laughs> Imagine if there are two of us. For some of us, we're thinking, good, more things will get done around here. And others are like, no, it would be worse if I had two of you. God only made one of us. We are an original. And God uses our life as a servant, not just to bring him glory, but to help others who are also in need. That's the mindset that Ruth had. She stuck to it. And she never compared herself with anyone else. While we were in Sri Lanka, uh, we were eating dinner, and it was outside, and it's, it's raining, and there's mud and, and things like that. So, you know, it's not the so-called environment that you want to be eating a dinner or a lunch. But that was the best environment for what we were doing. And there were some people who were coming to serve, and... You know, here in Hawaii, I think anywhere, you, you get up and you want to help, right? It's like, oh, you know, what, do you, what can I do? But, but for them, it was, no, 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 you're the guest, so don't help us. And it's almost like an insult if you get up and start doing things. So I, I figure, you know, just let them go. And there's this one woman, her name was Yvonne, and she came up and she was serving, and she would, you know, kindly bow. And I said, thank you so much. And she, you know, real, real humble in spirit. Then she would walk away, go get some other things. And when we were done, they would clean up and they would wash everything. Well, the convention, uh, it was a four-day convention. And part of the convention was they were going to award pastors who have been pastoring for 10 years, 15 years, and 25. So uh, on that night that we were honoring those pastors, her name was called. And she walked up on stage and she received the plaque. And, you know, everyone is applauding. And I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, I would have never known That here's a pastor who has been serving for 10 years, knowing that she's going to receive an award that night, did not come up to me and say, hey, I've been pastoring for 10 years and I'm receiving an award tonight. To her, it wasn't about that. To her, it was about serving her master, Jesus Christ, her Lord, her Savior. It wasn't about the position. It was about positioning herself so that she could serve. And I thought, boy, Lord, that's the kind of heart I want to have that a person who just continues to serve you no matter what. Is, and even speaking this today, it almost feels like this is, like I'm speaking to a church who knows this. You serve. You've been serving. That's why this church is here. That's why we can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, because people are serving right now. We're a servant-oriented church. And many of you have been serving. Pastor Marsha, who has been serving on Sundays on my behalf for speaking I thought, you know, the Bible tells us to make disciples. And if we don't give people a platform to exercise their gifts, like Pastor Marsha, we have people who are in the kitchen or are mighty marvels, and they're serving this morning with marvels on the move. Like we're, we're giving people opportunities to be discipled. That you're a church who welcomes that. To me, that is unbelievable. So thank you for being a church that continues to make disciples. Continue to do that. Continue to applaud those who are serving and thank them. And, and I do. I thank you that you're able to do this. And you're affecting people on the other side of the globe. We went there for training and teaching. And, and we got to remember, Sri Lanka, as a third world country, they just experienced their 9-11 with the bombings that happened on Easter Sunday. The people are feeling a heaviness. They're feeling discouraged. They're feeling uh, fear. But to see people come from the United States and speak life to them is life-changing for them. So thank you for being a church to send someone like me on the other side of the globe to bring hope to our brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka. When we left, you could sense that they had hope again as believers, that they weren't going to be dismayed or discouraged by the darkness and evil, that they were going to once again look to God as their hope and joy, that nothing of that nature is going to wreck them and, and, and distract them from the mission of reaching people for Jesus Christ. That takes a servant-minded church to do that. See, everything that we do for God with the heart of serving affects other people, not just here, but around the globe 
Therefore, in Galatians 6.10, it says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Serving is not an obligation. It is an opportunity. That we have an opportunity to serve. We have to shift, though, in our thinking of what is important and choose to be that servant. And then the last thing is to commit to making serving a lifestyle. It's a commitment because it's a lifestyle. It's, it's, this is forever. And when Ruth told Naomi, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God, uh, my God, and left Moab, that was it. That was her choice. She was all in. It was all or nothing, which is what Colossians tells us. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 it says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. We continue to serve no matter how uh, how our circumstances are or where life leads us. And Ruth continued to serve even though her life improved, even though she got better and, and was out of that poverty. She still served and still had that heart to make serving her lifestyle. Ruth knew her needs were going to be met. She married again and she was fine, but then she still thought of other people. See, when you have a servant mindset, circumstances that become better doesn't change the fact that you're still the servant. It still keeps you with that servant mind to think of other people. The Bible even instructs us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. So as a Christian, serving is a part of our response which is why we need to shift our thinking of what is most important and choose to be a servant and commit to that lifestyle of serving. That's why we talk about SALT Conference. That's why we have this conference. It's so that for many of us, if you've been serving, this is our once a year equipping and once again readjusting our, our focus and our, our vision on what is important, Lord. Where, where are you taking us as we serve and learn together, which is what SALT stands for in our, in our, as we use it as an acrostic. Who are, who are we, Lord? And it once again recalibrates our heart to the vision that God has given to us. But it's also for many of you who have been coming and maybe you want to know the heart and vision of the church and maybe you want to serve and you're thinking, how do I get involved? How can I use my gift? That's where the SALT conference comes in. I, I'll tell you this, you will not be disappointed by attending because God is going to speak something that will change the trajectory of your life. It comes through serving our Lord and Savior. In the book of Titus, chapter 3, verse 8, it says that this is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. It's part of our core values that everyone has a place to belong and serve. That we equip the next generation and we raise them up that everyone is gifted and has at least one gift to serve God. You know, at the bottom of your notes, or if you're not taking notes, you can think about this, that it says, tomorrow I will. And if you are taking notes, I know on the app you might not be able to do this, but I wanted, to, I wanted us to see the word tomorrow and cross that out and put today. So you might have to do that mentally. Today I will. The reason why we cross that out is because we always say tomorrow. But today, what will I do different today? How can we be different today as servants of the Most High God? And again, like I said, I, it's almost like speaking to you as a church who already does this. And it almost seems like, boy, you should be, you should be speaking this because this is who you are as a church. You serve people, you serve people not even in church, you'll serve people out there. But for some reason, this is our message, message that God wanted us to have. And how can we be that servant person and go out there and be just like Jesus? Some of us will serve here, and that's great. Use your gifts for God. I understand that. That's, that's awesome. But we're going to pray for that. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a moment that today I will do this. Whether it's Maybe it's signing up for the SALT conference. Maybe it's inviting someone to, to come to the SALT conference. It's what will you get to do today? So Father, Lord God, we thank you that you already have given us an example of what it means to serve. So we want to be those people. And if we've been serving, Lord, and, and we've been 
uh, learning and growing together, can you, can you once again strengthen us so that, so that we can serve you well and maybe even possibly reach out to others, connect with them so that they too can be a part of what you're doing throughout the world. We want to be just like you, Lord, not to be served, but to serve. I pray that for all of us, Lord, I pray for your blessing over each and every person here today and those online, that we would be the servants to people today who represent you well. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. And if you agree with that, will you say amen? Amen, amen, amen.